silent prayer. where we left off in the last presentation. Uh, we saw basically this uh, pattern of Galatians chapter 4, this Galatians 4 experience, the first seven verses, and how Christ gave us the perfect pattern, the perfect example to follow. Right? And we saw that uh, Jesus was born here, and I corrected here, it was not the birth of Christ, it was the birth of Jesus, to be more precise. Right? Because Jesus was not the Christ at the beginning, but he was the Christ, or he became the Christ at his baptism, the anointing. Okay? So, and when he was a child, it says he differed from a servant, but was under the bondage of the elements of this world. Obviously, Christ himself, as I already mentioned, he never was a sinner, he never was in bondage to sin. But he just played the role as if he was. You know, he placed himself under the types, he learned the scriptures, he learned the types in order that he can then understand the plan of salvation and obey it step by step by faith. Amen? Amen. Okay, good. So, and this is what we read in Galatians chapter 4. So, he then gave us a pattern you know, that would lead us down to the time appointed to the baptism. And the baptism is the new birth, okay? So Christ showed us, you're not born again at the very beginning, but at the beginning, you are in a natural mindset. You, know, you start off with a natural birth, and you must be led down to your spiritual birth, to the new birth. And only if you place yourself under the tutors and governors, only if you learn the types and understand what they point to, then you can come to the time appointed to the baptism, and the Father can be well pleased with you, right? Because we saw, when, when do you please God? When you exercise faith. Exercise faith in what? In His Word, right? In His pattern, in His promises. Everything that He gave us, this is what you need to do. Okay, so, and um, now let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. And Galatians chapter 3 is obviously the chapter that comes before Galatians chapter 4. Right? So, and this is just a rundown. Yeah, Paul gives us a rundown. He always wants to repeat the same thought in the book of Galatians. And in our next presentations here, yeah, we will spend much time in the book of Galatians. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's go now to Galatians chapter verse 22 because here we see a similar thought that he utters in Galatians chapter 4 here he just uses different words okay, to describe the same thing it says but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe so how do you obtain the promise what does it say here by faith, you must believe. Okay, believe in God's word in His pattern. And uh, it goes on to say, "But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed." Okay, here Paul apparently says that there's a time when there's no faith. Okay, it seems like it. Right, that's what he says here. And before faith came. There was a time where we were shut up under the law. Okay, but I will explain 
this portfolio as we go on. Um, so shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So the faith that needs to be revealed, okay? Verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Okay, so <clears throat> similar illustration, right? Because what does it say here? What are you under before you're justified by faith? You're in the schoolmaster. Okay, and the schoolmaster is according to verse 23, what? Or the 24, sorry. What is the schoolmaster? The law. Okay? Yes. So the law is all these types and figures, right? Yes? yes? It's also the Ten Commandments, yeah, but both yeah, should teach you. Now, what, what is the difference between the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments? Because the Jews sometimes called the law of Moses the law, then sometimes they called the Ten Commandments the law, then sometimes they called both together the law. So what is the difference between the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments? Yeah, the Ten Commandments is the moral law, right? And the law of Moses was all the rituals and the types and figures and all these things. Yeah? The feasts, the temple rituals, the sacrifices and all these things. Yes? Okay. So, and the moral law, what does it do to you? What is the purpose of the moral law? Yeah, shows you. Yes. Uh, Romans, uh, just keep your finger here. Let's go to Romans 3, verse 21, I think. Oh no, verse 19. No, 20, 20. Romans 3, 20. Sorry. It says, it says, therefore by the deeds of the law there is no flesh be justified in a sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay? So the Ten Commandments, uh, sin is the transgression of the law, it says. Right? Romans 3, 20, 20. Okay. So the Ten Commandments, they show you that you are a sinner. Right? But the types and figures... The rituals, what did they show you? Yeah, how to again be reconciled to God, right? Yes. Because the law, the types and figures, it said basically, okay, you need to then go sacrifice a certain animal, and this would reconcile you again with God. Okay? So, both things, when we go back to Galatians chapter 3, both things are given by God to bring us to Christ, it says, okay? So, because when you're convicted to be a sinner, what are you looking for? You're looking for a savior, for a redeemer, right? Yes. For a solution to your sin problem. And the types and figures, they show you then, they point to the redeemer, right? They show you how you can be reconciled with God again. So, okay. So, now let's go back to Galatians 3. So the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Verse 25. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. All right. So now let's bring this together with Galatians chapter 4. Because Galatians chapter 4 says, when you're a child, you're, you're the servant to sin, you're in bondage, and you're under tutors and governors. And the tutors and governors was the types, right? Yes. The law, okay? Until the time appointed. And when you became a, came to the time appointed, what are you no longer? You're no longer a uh, servant. You're no longer a child. You're now a son, right? Yes. And when you're a son, you're no longer under the tutors and governors, right? Yes. You're no longer under the types. You're no longer under the schoolmaster, okay? Yes. So this is the schoolmaster. So, good. Therefore also Galatians chapter 3 brings us, therefore to this time when you're born again in the baptism, 
and where it says you're no longer under the schoolmaster, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But what are you now? What does it say? When you come here, according to Galatians 3, verse 24, mm -hmm. you're justified by faith. faith. Okay? Yes. So, here you're justified by faith. Alright. And yeah, when Christ came here, he pleased God. Right? Therefore, he manifested faith. Yeah, this, this is what justified him. Only faith can please God. Faith in his word. Right? So, and just to prove this, and let's just read on in Galatians 3, because Paul now also points us here to the baptism. Verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ. So when you have this faith, you are now a child of God, it says. Yes? yes. And verse 27. For as many as uh, many of you as have been baptized. baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So here brings you to the same point to the baptism. Then verse uh, 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, what do you become here? Yes, yes you become heirs. Why? And there was the right answer. You become Abraham's seed. Okay? But we studied earlier who, who is Abraham's seed? Christ. Okay? But when you come here, you also become Abraham's seed. Okay? Because you are now like Christ. Okay? When you obtained the first birth, you followed the pattern just like him followed. He, or just like he followed the pattern. And now yeah, you reflect his image. How, how do we know this? Okay, so let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And let's read verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So, what did Adam and Eve be, uh, receive here? The Spirit of God, right? Yes. So, it's an illustration of when you're born again, you're baptized, you receive the Spirit of God, right? And when you go to chapter 1, verse 27, It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So how were they created in the beginning? In the image of God. Okay, what does, what does it mean? Yeah, it was in his character, right? Yes. Okay, so in Brother Mark already showed us, yeah, when you can, Take the past, the former things, and show the future with it. What what do you become? Gods with a small g. Okay, you're you're again in his image. Okay, so because when you go now to Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Second Corinthians 5.17 It says Therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold all things are become new. So when you're born again what are you? A new creature. So what did the Lord do to you? He created you. Again. Okay. So he basically brought you back 
to the beginning to, the, to be in the image of God, yeah, to reflect his character. Okay, because what is now written in your mind, in your heart? The law of God. Okay, you now reflect his character again. Yeah. Yes? Okay, good. Now let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. So you become now Abraham's seed when you're born again. And therefore you are now a joint heir with Christ. Now I want to go now to this point that uh, where it says, verse 23, Galatians 3.23, it says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. So, when you are under this law, what does Paul say? What has not yet come? Faith. Faith. Okay. So what does it mean? Okay. So go one first verse up to verse 22. And because when the Bible speaks of faith, it doesn't speak of this faith that we have. Okay. It speaks about this faith that we can read in verse 22. Let's read. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So how do you obtain the promise? By faith of Jesus Christ. So therefore what faith is it? Yeah, the faith that Jesus had. Okay, and his faith was what kind of faith? By every word of God, right? Okay, can we profess that, that we live by every word of God already? No. Yeah. Our faith is not there yet. Yes? So, but the Lord, he wants to teach us faith. And how does he teach us faith again? What did we read? Where does faith come from? Yeah, by hearing the word of God, right? It comes from God's word. So, he places us under the word of God, under the tutors and governments, under the schoolmaster. Yeah, that we can learn God's word in order to learn faith. Yes? Yes. Okay, but he places us under the types first. Why must he place us under the types first? Why can he not immediately teach us the anti-type? Sorry? Yes, that's true. But why? Yes, we're carnal. Okay, so let's go to First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two, verse fourteen. This speaks about our natural mindset here. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So what's the problem with us? We have, we're natural, yeah, because here at the beginning, what birth was it of Christ? Natural. This natural birth, okay? So he was illustrating us when we are born naturally, we have a natural mind, and what can, can we not understand therefore? Spiritual, spiritual things. things, okay? So therefore, in order that the Lord can teach us spiritual things, what must he do first? Yeah, he, he, he needs to reach out to us where we are, right, with our mind. And therefore he teaches in yeah, and parables, right? The parables is the natural in order to point you to the spiritual. So he uses these natural things that we can readily understand because we think natural, that he can eventually guide us to the spiritual meaning of these things. You know? But it takes time, okay, for our minds to adapt to spiritual thoughts. Because what does Isaiah 55 say about God's thoughts? Yeah, they are higher than our thoughts, yeah? So, 
And therefore, you know, spiritual things it says here are foolishness to our natural mind. So you know, sometimes I remember, uh, sometimes I, when I started in this message, sometimes also I thought, huh, is this not a little bit foolishness what was presented there? Okay. Because I didn't really understand it. But once I saw it, then I was saying, oh, Lord, forgive me. Okay. I am the fool, not the Lord, obviously. Okay. So, and this is important, yeah, that we therefore need to go and ask God that he would teach us what these natural things mean, that we can learn the spiritual understanding of them. Okay, good. Um, what, was, what was the reason why God brought in the Old Testament? I mean, which, which covenant is actually older, the Old Covenant or the New Covenant? Yeah, the New Covenant is older, okay? Seems like a contradiction at first glance, okay? But why is the Old or the New Covenant older than the Old Covenant? The New Covenant was given by promise, and the Old Covenant was given as a type and fulfillment. Yes, okay, so the, the New Covenant was already instituted in Eden, okay? Adam and Eve lived under the New Covenant by promise. But when was the Old Testament given? At Mount Sinai, right? Yes. Way after Adam and Eve, way after Abraham. Abraham, for instance, is a, a hero of faith, right? Yes. Okay, he was justified by faith, it says. Okay? So, why was it necessary that the Old Covenant was instituted? Because they brought the new, they lack faith to receive the Yes, okay. So let's just let's just go to Hebrews chapter eleven for now. Because Hebrews eleven is this chapter about the heroes of faith, right? Yes. And what did we see? How is it only possible that we can please God? By faith, okay? Unless we have the faith of Jesus, we cannot enter the kingdom of God, okay? So, and let's see now um, verse 4. Hebrews 11, verse 4. It says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. So, what did Abel exercise? Faith, faith right? Yeah. And he was pronounced righteous based upon this faith. He was justified by faith. How? What did he do? He gave the true sacrifice, the true offering, right? Okay. And it says here, by faith. And what does it mean by faith? What did we see? What is faith? It's according to God's word, right? So he knew how to exercise faith. And he was then justified by faith. Okay, so did Abel therefore know to which, to what the sacrifice point? Yes, he knew that it was pointing to Christ, right? Therefore he was exercising now faith in the in the antitype, okay? And this is what we need to understand. It's the faith in the antitype that will save us. Yeah? Faith in the natural things doesn't bring us any uh, grace or any profit, okay? Because what does it say? The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life and peace. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right. The point I want to make is that and Sister White confirms this also, that the New Testament yeah, was the, the covenant that, for instance, Abel, Adam and Eve, Abraham, yeah, all these people, they were under the New Covenant. Okay? 
but only by promise. And when was this covenant ratified? At the cross, when the blood was spilled, right? To basically pay this, the sins. Okay. But why did the Lord have to introduce an old covenant? Because, I mean, the new covenant was the covenant that he established at the cross, right? This is the covenant he wants us to be under. So why was there a need for an old covenant? Yes, exactly. Because they were in Egyptian bondage, right? And what happened in the Egyptian bondage? They forgot God, right? They forgot the law, they forgot the commandments of God, they mingled. Yeah, they mingled with these strange wives. And strange wives, what is, an, is this an illustration for, a type for? Yeah, for all its doctrines, right? Okay, for error. So now let's go to John chapter 8. Verse 32, John 8, 32. John 8, 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So what is it that makes us free? The truth, okay? Therefore, on the opposite, what brings us into bondage? Error, Error okay? So, and there are more, there are so many examples in the Bible uh, when you marry these strange wives, these false doctrines, they always brought God's people into bondage, okay? So, <coughs> error brings you into bondage, and, okay, so in order that the Lord can deliver you from this bondage, he must teach you the truth again, okay? Mm -hmm. But when you are in bondage, when you are in error, what don't you have? Right? Yes, okay. But what, what did we read? Before what came? Faith came, right? Yes. So, because faith is always faith in God's word. And God's word is what? Is truth, right? Yes. So, you can only exercise true faith when you have the truth, okay? But when you have a faith that is based upon truth and error, your truth can never be, uh, your faith can never be the faith of Jesus, okay? Yes. And this faith cannot set you free, okay? So, all right. So when they were now in Egypt and they had this corrupted faith, because they had this corrupted understanding of God, of his word, they, in what mindset were they, therefore? When, when you have no faith, okay, let me just give you one more f uh, verse that might help you. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, I think it is, Ephesians 2, verse 10 or so. No, verse 8, Ephesians 2, verse 8. Ephesians 2 verse 8 it says for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God so how do you obtain the grace through faith okay and when you have no grace what is ruling in you In the flesh, right? Yes. Your carnal mind is ruling. Okay? Yes. So therefore, when they were in Egypt, they had a corrupted understanding of God's word. Therefore, they had a corrupted faith. And thus, they had no grace. Okay? Yes. And when they had no grace, in what mindset were they? Natural. In the natural mindset. Okay. So could they benefit at all from the new covenant, which is the covenant of faith, the spiritual covenant? No, no right? Yes. 
They didn't understand anymore what the sacrifices were pointing to, so they could not exercise faith like, for instance, Abel did. Okay? They could not exercise faith in the antitype. Therefore, what had the Lord to do? He had to reach out where they were, right? They were now in a natural mindset, and therefore they had to now be brought under a covenant that taught them literal things first. Okay? Literal sacrifices, literal rituals, all these literal things that the Lord put in place under the old covenant in order that he could bring them back to the new covenant, uh, to the covenant of faith. Okay? And this is what we read in Galatians 3. Before faith came, we are shut up under the law, under this Old Testament, until faith is revealed, until faith, faith is manifested. Yeah, when you learn the lessons of this Old Covenant, of the schoolmaster, you learn faith. Okay? And this is exactly what we learn at the moment. That we learn now to exercise faith. Exercise faith in what the types point forward. Okay? Everybody follows? Yes. Okay. So, this is what we need to learn. And when we come here to the baptism, those of us who come to the baptism to the time appointed and get born again, we will be like Christ, where the Father says, Now you're my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Because you now exercise faith. You learned the lesson to exercise faith. Yes? Because only faith pleases God. Okay. So, thus, and it begins here with no faith to the faith of Jesus. Okay, and we already said, where does faith come from? Yeah. From the Word of God. Okay. You start off in a natural world, you have a natural mind, you have no faith. But at the time of the end, what does the Lord always do? Gives an increase of knowledge, right? He sends no light, and this is like the beginning of faith, okay? The beginning where you learn how to exercise faith, okay? So, and all along the way, He you know, gives you more and more light, teaches you more and more of these types in order that you eventually can come to the point where you really have the faith of Jesus. And then he will reveal this faith. And he will bring you into a situation where you then will manifest that you learned the lesson. Okay? Yes. And this will be this test and trial at the very end. Okay? So, <clears throat> and when you pass this test because you now learn to exercise faith, you will be born again at the end. You know, the Lord can change your heart. So, right now, everything depends upon whether you learn what these types point to in our time and exercise faith into these types. And I just want to give you some practical examples. Okay? So, for instance, I know that also happened here you know, in Kenya, but also in our place in Austria, Germany, and all, all these places. Yeah. For instance, yeah. based upon the prophetic pattern, yeah, we learned things that happened before our eyes. Right? For instance, how could we ever understand that this serpent bite is a test for us? By knowing what the types mean at the end of the world. Right? So first, we, we took these ancient stories we applied the antitype to it by placing them into the Sunday law. Right? This is where they belong perfectly. And then we could see the same pattern, the same principles repeating also in our time. Right? Prefigured. Prefigured in our time. So for instance, I'll just give you a brief example. What does the, what does the Bible say? When the Sunday law comes and you don't obey it, what can't you do anymore? By yourself. For instance, now, when the serpent bite comes and you don't take it, what can't you do anymore? 
Yeah, they restrict your freedom of buying and selling. Yeah? It's not in the same degree yet as it will be under the Sunday law, but you can see the same principle. Okay? And <clears throat> yeah, they, they basically make you the scapegoat. Right? They, they, make, they say, like in the Sunday law, they will say, okay, because they don't keep the Sunday, they bring all the troubles upon the society. That's what they also do with all the people that don't take the certain bite, right? They say they are the troublers. They are the cause for all these corona outbreaks and all these things, yeah? And you have many other similarities between what happens under the Sunday law that is also happening now in this time about because of this certain bite you know, that they want to put in you, okay? So, and based upon these things, yeah, we, we learn present truth, and yeah, we learn present duty for our time, okay? And it's only by first understanding what the types point to in the anti-type, and then we can learn even principles for our time. And this gives us an instruction what we need to do in our time. Okay, so now, yeah, when you know all these things, uh, let's say, now you're confronted with a situation in your life. Yeah, you know, demanded, let's say, by your employer to take the serpent bite or you will lose your job. Is this now a test of faith for you? Yes, yes right? So, but you can also say, ah, no, this is foolishness. Yeah? Well, what you... What you showed there from the word, I don't see it. I, I don't see anything about a certain bite here in the scriptures. Okay, I don't see this, yeah? and therefore I don't think it's a wrong thing to take it. I can then keep my job. Okay, so if you would act like this, you would not exercise faith in the anti-type, right? But if you would say no, I believe this is really a test now for me. You begin to start exercising faith in what God showed us from the past histories. Yes, everybody can see this? Yeah. And all other decisions you know, that we are making based upon the prophetic pattern that the Lord shows us by going to the old stories, bring them to the Sunday law, and then taking the principles for our time. If you follow these patterns, you exercise faith. Okay? And the more you believe in these things, the clearer you will make a stand for what is right, okay? And obviously, you know, the more the Lord can uphold you, okay? Because he will give you grace to then resist the temptations. And this is what we need to learn, brothers and sisters, yeah? that actually already now, in many daily things, we are being tested whether we truly believe what is laid out or whether we only pay lip service to it, okay? But, you know, the, obviously, the real test is just before us. Yeah? Because we understand, you know, when you go to the Sunday law, what happens here at this way, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, you will be delivered up, right? Okay, so when you're delivered up, where will you be cast into? Prison, right? Yes. Why? Because you don't want to bow down and worship Sunday, right? Yes. So now if you apply this to our time, and when you come now to this waymark, I mean, these things are not here marked at this waymark, I wanted to illustrate this whole time period here, okay? But when you come to this waymark here, which is the same pattern as here, okay? Yes. What can we therefore expect in principle? What will happen here? You will be delivered up, you will come before authorities. In, the, in our time it's not the Sunday law, but it's the serpent bite. Okay? And you need to stand for what is true, even though you might face prison. Okay? So, and this will be a true test for us. Right? Okay. So, but only if you kept up, if you really understand these things for yourself, yeah, being sure that really these types of the old time have really point to these things in our time, only then you will have the faith to say, all right, I'm willing to sacrifice my job, 
to even be separated maybe from my family, yeah, and go even to prison in order to remain loyal to God. Do you see this? And this will be a test of faith, brothers and sisters, because I don't know about the prisons here in Kenya. I think they're pretty bad, I guess. Okay, so probably you don't want to end up there, okay? Unless you're sure that it's God's will that you should be there, right? Okay, so, and I don't know, yeah, I also heard here from one brother uh, in Kenya, it's apparently you know, your parents have a lot of control over you, right? They are very strict, and they say, you should do this, and you should not do this, yes? And it's difficult for you guys to obey God rather than man sometimes, right? So, so therefore you will be confronted with many, many diffi difficult situations, many difficult decisions you will need to make. And you will only be able to make these decisions if you really have faith in the pattern, in the types, how they point to the anti-type, how they then, how these same principles of the anti-type then are repeated in our time. Okay? Only if you truly believe this, only if you have your own faith established in the world and see this, these things for yourself, you can stand this test. Okay? Because otherwise you'll say, no, I'm not con convinced enough. This is a too great a sacrifice. Okay? So, and this is, brothers and sisters, what is coming. Okay? We will be tested whether we place ourselves under these tutors and governors whether we learned the faith, how to exercise faith, yeah, whether we really are then able to hold fast to what God's word says, no matter what. And at the same time, now what did Brother Mark show you? What did he show you yesterday? Matthew 24. Begins with the Sunday law, it says, nation shall rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And what rises up there also? False, False prophets. Yes. But then, when you come here, they deliver you unto death, right? Yes. So they deliver you up to become, go before kings. But what comes up here also? Yes. False prophets. Okay. So, I don't know about you, but for instance, how does the, the mafia work? The mafia. How, how do they work? Mafia. Yes. Okay. I mean, there's a saying in German, I don't know how to really translate it in English, but it's like, you can either choose sugar or the rot. Okay? That's what they offer you. They say, all right, you can take this bribe, yeah, or we will kill your family. Okay? So, in this sense, this is a satanic work, right? Satan offers you an easy way to get out or he says, I will make your life a misery and I will destroy you and your family. Okay? And this is exactly what will come up here. Okay? Here, but in our time prefigured here. So you will, we will be brought before these authorities and Satan will use them. Uh, the, the state power is the dragon, right? And they will threaten you with all these things, with fines and imprisonment. And at the same time, Satan will raise up false prophets that will tell you an easy way to get out of this, these circumstances, okay? So, and only if you really are established in God's word, only if you are established in the message, when you know what the types teach, that they really tell you that you must stand here, and you must be willing to go to prison, you know? only then you will be able to make the sacrifice. It's the cross, brothers and sisters. Okay? And it's only the beginning of the test. You must endure until the end, it says. Right? So, and that's why you will be crying day and night for deliverance. Okay? Because it will truly bring you to your limits. This is what we need to understand. The Lord will bring us to the limits. Because what must happen to John the Baptist? He must come out of the belly. Right? You must have a belly experience. We must have a belly experience. And when you go to Genesis chapter 3, and the Lord already at the very beginning showed us 
uh, that the new birth experience is not a pleasant thing, okay? At the, in a sense, to get there, okay? Once you have it, it's a pleasant thing, okay? But to arrive at this point, it's not so pleasant, because it says here in Genesis 3, 16, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So how was she, she to bring forth children? In sorrow. In sorrow. Okay. It's a time of tribulation. It's a belly experience. Okay. So, <clears throat> therefore, it's the only way, brothers and sisters, how we can be born again. Because otherwise our hearts are stiff-necked and stubborn and rebellious against God and we will never really submit to Him. Yeah, he must bring us into these fiery trials that we cry day and night for deliverance. Only then are we willing to yield our cherished idols of this world. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, therefore, these things are a warning to us of what is coming. But they are also promises to us. And because the Lord promises us, when we endure, we will be born again and we will become John the Baptist. Is this not the greatest privilege that we can ever imagine? What did, what did Jesus say about John the Baptist? He was the greatest prophet. Okay. So, when I think about these things, I know I want to be there, okay? I want to be among those that represent John the Baptist. Yeah. And the working of God's Spirit, we can never even dream of what it will be like. Yeah, when people will be so convicted, and will repent in tears, and will be uh, truly baptized, okay? So, and therefore this is what is ahead of us, but in order that the Lord can bring us to this point, uh, we must submit to these tutors and governors, we must learn the lesson of faith. Because that's the only means how we can save us. How we can bring us through this terrible temptation and crisis that will come upon each one of us. Amen? Okay. So, I think for now we can make a break. We can go to lunch. And, and then after we now I want to ask you a, a question, you know, how we should proceed, that we can then make the best arrangement uh, where everybody can receive the greatest benefit from it. But now let's uh, first close with a prayer and then we can just speak about this quickly. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that uh, you brought us thus far and that you place us under these tutors and governors to teach us faith and how to exercise faith. And Lord, we beg you and plead to you that you would help us, that we would get ready for this time of crisis that is soon to be upon us, that we would make the necessary sacrifices by faith, that we would really be able to trust in your word because we know it for ourselves, because we know its truth and that we are really required to undergo this terrible time of uh, temptation and crisis that we can eventually come out of this belly and be born again. Help us therefore to uh, look not only at these warnings but also at the promises and for the glories that await us when we just endure this, this little time of distress, as Paul says, and that we then can receive these great blessings that you have in store for us. We thank you for this honor and privilege to be here to learn of your truth and to learn more and more about your plan of salvation, how you want to bring us to this born-again experience. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.